Hello, everyone. Um, and welcome to the second Edictum Day conference in Bucharest. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, for sure, to be here on a very pleasant Monday evening. Um, your presence is honoring us, for sure. Uh, my name is Paul Mureșan, and together with my friends from Edictum Day, will be your host tonight. Uh, so from the start, just a small itinerary about or of this evening. Uh, after my introduction, uh, our guest, Dennis Prager, will have the keynote speech tonight. Um, and in the end, it's going to be a Q&A session. Uh, we will use Slido for, for this. Please send your questions there during the speech or at the end of the speech, whatever you want. Um, and use the code Dennis Prager for, for doing this. Some small words about Edictum Day, about our organization. So Edictum Day has uh, two main objectives in, in its mission and vision, let's say. It seeks to keep the Judeo-Christian values in the public forum on the one hand, and on the other hand, it seeks to keep the conservative ideas in the political arena. So tonight it's about both objectives and especially about the second one. Uh, and we have the perfect guest with us to help us with it. Uh, some Brief words about our guests. So I have an official introduction for Dennis and a more personal one, let's say. I'll try both. So the official one is this, Dennis Prager. It's one of the most respected and influential thinkers, writers, and speakers in America. He is nationally syndicated talk show host in the US. He's the founder of Prager University, Prager U, I guess. Um, the vast majority of you, all of you heard about this. The most viewed conservative video site in the world. Since its founding, PragerU videos have received over 2 billion views, more than half by people under the age of 35. So it's extremely, extremely influential. And I'll go for the more personal introduction of uh, Dennis Prager tonight. So Dennis Prager changes the way his listeners live for the better, including us in Edictum Day, I would say. A lot of people from his listeners say that by listening to Dennis, they became better husbands, better wives, better sons, better daughters, better human beings in, their, in general. Um, from our brief moments spent together, I saw that his attitude is always filled with gratitude. So he's a happy human being as a direct consequence. Everybody that spent at least one minute with him knows this. Um, he has a theory on everything, I guess, uh, from, um, I don't know, maybe fountain pens to the multiverse. So I guess we can ask a lot of questions tonight. He is warm, extremely funny, extremely friendly, cheerful, and filled with common sense. Because common sense can only be cheerful, by the way. As some of us do, uh, he loves classical music. Uh, but uh, at a conductor scale, rather. He conducts orchestras periodically. When he wants to get closer to God, as he would put it, he listens to Bach, and I guess he's not the, not the only one. Um, when he wants to celebrate life in general, he listens to Haydn. So that makes perfect sense for the classical music, um, for those involved in classical music in general. He knows that the best combination involving Bruckner is Bruckner interpreted by our Sergio Celibidake. So he, he has something in common with us also, at least in classical music area. Um, Dennis is here with his wife, Sue, uh, the Prager U co-founder and executive director, Alan Estrin, is standing there, yeah, at your left. Um, and with his wife, Susan, and with their friends and listeners that accompanied, accompanied them on the Danube cruise this week. Um, so let's give all of them a warm welcome to Romania and to Bucharest, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, dear Paul. Uh, these, uh, these people at this magnificent organization, Addictum Day, are uh, worthy of your knowing. They are doing things in Romania that are, in the best sense, revolutionary. Yeah, I, I know we could use people like this in America. 
They are very, very special people fighting for freedom and for fighting for keeping the Western civilization alive and Judeo-Christian values. For those of you from Romania, I will say something in Romanian. With God's help, I will get it largely correct. Miar placea sa pot cine acest discurs in Romaniste. For those of you who do not speak Romanian as well as I do, <laughs> I said I would like to give this talk in Romanian. It's actually true, I wish I could. I learned a few languages. I remember I was in Romania when it was communist, when the man who built this building was in power, Ceausescu. I, I, I studied communism because I believed it was important to understand the false god of our time. By the way, I will tell you what I say in America, and it's a very sad thing. I studied communism, and I learned Russian, and I went to communist countries frequently, including Romania. And I never imagined that what I studied would be applicable to America. It never, it never occurred to me as a possibility. And yet all of my studies of Marxism and communism and totalitarianism and tyranny, I see the possibilities of in the United States of America, which at that time was the beacon of liberty in the world. It's a very sad thing for me to tell you, but I, I think that we have to be honest about what is happening. When I was in uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, as it was known then, and Hungary, and Romania, and Bulgaria, which I went to on a number of occasions to, again, understand communism, which I hated, so I know Russian. That's, I did study that at university. So I would say to people in Eastern Europe, whether any one of those countries, because they usually didn't speak English and I didn't speak Hungarian or Romanian or Bulgarian. So I felt we could get along in Russian. And the answer I almost always got was, Da, anyechachu. Yes, but I don't want to. That was the answer that I received. Uh, but then they would speak to me in Russian because there was no other way to converse. So I want to speak to you tonight about defining what it is to be a conservative. I have found all of my life that people use terms, but they don't know how to define them. And the lack of ability to explain what you stand for is the crisis of the West. Americans did not explain America. Jews did not explain Judaism. Christians did not explain Christianity. People did not, conservatives did not explain conservatism. This is the root of our dilemma, that people did not explain what they believe in because they didn't know how, to be perfectly honest. But I, in speaking to uh, Paul and, and the, the other wonderful people uh, that I have met with now, second time I spoke here five years ago, uh, they asked me that I address some words to the issue of the Russian-Ukrainian war and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, because there are many conservatives in the United States, and here I learn in Romania, uh, who uh, do not support Ukraine in their fight. And a reason, not the only, but a reason, is that Putin claims to be fighting the Western values that are now dominant 
in many ways, the values that are dominant in many Western countries. Putin claims to be a spokesman for traditional values. In Putin's Russia, men are men, men do not give birth. Just to give an example, and it is something I will come to on a number of occasions. So let, let me deal with that just for a moment about a conservative and how a conservative should view uh, the war in Ukraine. There are many arguments. One is that Putin stands for traditional values, for even Christian values, and the West is jettisoning, getting rid of all of those values. Another argument is that he was sort of forced to uh, uh, invade Ukraine uh, because of threats that uh, Ukraine would join NATO. There are any number of arguments uh, in America. Often they will say, why are we spending billions of dollars protecting Ukraine's borders when we don't spend almost anything protecting our own American borders? So let me, let me deal specifically with the question of, well, Putin deserves conservatives' support because he is standing up for conservative values against what is happening in the West. So I'll begin with this conservative's response. I am deeply rooted in the Bible. That is the source of my values. And my favorite verse in the entire Bible is from Psalms. And since I said something in Romanian, I'll say something in Hebrew, a language I do know. O have Adonai sin ura. Those of you who love God must hate evil. If you cannot acknowledge that Putin's invasion of Ukraine is evil, then we have a different definition of evil. I, 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 and and it, is, it is a conservative's obligation to oppose evil. The argument that he, it, he speaks against the terrible things happening in the West, is it, even if it is true, and to a certain extent, it is true. But so what? Let me take the example of Stalin. Stalin, at least after 1941, Stalin was anti-Nazi, anti-Hitler. Therefore, he was an ally in fighting Hitler, an ally of the West. But that didn't make Stalin a good man. Stalin was a beast. Stalin was despicable. Stalin was one of the most evil humans to ever be on this earth. Just because he was anti-Nazi didn't make him right. Just because Putin is anti the crazy values that are taking place in the West doesn't make him right. That's that. Why, why can't we? In, in America, there's a saying, can you chew gum and walk at the same time? We should be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. We can say Putin has done evil and he's right about what is happening in the West. Okay, I can say that, but he has done evil. And he runs a country with no freedom. If you oppose him, you, you go to prison or you die. That, that's bad. How could a conservative support such a man? Stalin was right about the Nazis. Was he right about the Gulag? Was he right about the massacre of the Polish intelligentsia in Katyn Forest? Was he right about annexing Eastern Poland? Was he right about his totalitarian state? Was he right about his aid to Mao Zedong and Kim Il-sung? It was Stalin who made the, the 60 million dead in China possible by his support for Mao. The, the man was evil. Was he right about forcing communism on Romania? How could a Romanian conservative forget that? Stalin was anti-Hitler. So what? There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing else right about 
about Stalin. And he was only anti-Hitler in any event because Hitler invaded. He was pro-Hitler until Hitler invaded. It's worth remembering. So uh, I could spend the entire evening just on the war in Ukraine, but I don't think that is why I came to Romania. But I did want to address that. And if you would like to ask about that during the question period, I would welcome it. What is a conservative? So number one, a conservative says that truth is the most important value. Years ago, I wrote a, an, an essay that lies were the root of evil. I wrote this for University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, their, their magazine. It shows you how things have changed. It is inconceivable UCLA would publish me today. But they did publish me then. And I wrote, lies are the root of evil. The Holocaust was possible because of the lies told about Jews. That was it. Hitler told lies about Jews. People believed it. It was the, it's a, a war of survival between Germans and Jews. If the Jews survive, the Germans are destroyed. If the Germans survive, the Jews are destroyed. Lies about blacks made slavery possible. Lies are, are the root of evil. So truth is the greatest value. We are living in the age of the lie. I can give you so many examples. This too could be its own lecture. In the United States, we are swimming in an ocean of lies. America is, uh, is systemically racist, is one of the great lies in American history. No nation in the history of the world has had such a successful experiment in a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious culture. It is just a terrible lie that people are told about America and blacks. I'll give you one, one example that is very common in American schools. Black slaves made America. Well, if black slaves made America, really, then why wasn't Brazil more prosperous than America? If American affluence and prosperity is due to black slavery, there were about 10 times more slaves imported to Brazil than to the United States. Why isn't Brazil the richest country in the Western world, in the Western hemisphere at least? It's just a lie that America was built by slaves. The South was the, was the poorest part of America. That's where slavery was. The richest part of America had no slaves. Kids in the United States are drowning in lies. I don't know how common it is here. I can't speak to that. But I'm telling you, it is happening in the United States and it is happening increasingly in Western Europe. Of course, men give birth. I don't know how much that has hit Romania yet. I don't know if men give birth in Romania quite as often as men give birth in America. But uh, in America, if you say men do not give birth, you are considered by the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN to be a hater. You are a bad human being if you deny that men give birth by the greatest of our media. The New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, NBC, CBS, ABC, all of them. They will all declare you a bigot, a hater, if you deny that men give birth. That's how bad it's gotten in the United States. If you say it at a university, you can lose your ability to teach. If a professor says men do not give birth, there's a very good chance that professor will lose his or her job. Sex is not binary. There are more than two sexes. Do you know that this is taught in most schools in the United States of America? Most children are taught that there are more than two sexes, or as they call it now, genders. 
Do you know that most teachers do not say boys and girls anymore in their classrooms? They just say students because they don't divide their classes between boys and girls. Disneyland doesn't say welcome boys and girls. It just says welcome dreamers of all ages or whatever their term is. No more boys and girls. In the London Tube, years ago, they stopped saying ladies and gentlemen. They now say passengers. This, so this is not just in America. That was an, that was an English example that I just gave you. This is all a gigantic lie. We are living in the age of lies. I know about lies because I wrote a book, one of my books is on anti-Semitism. And the greatest national lie in history was called the blood libel. In the Middle Ages, there were Christians who said that Jews kill Christian children to use their blood to bake matzah, the Passover, Pesach bread, for Passover. It was a gigantic lie. Jews were not allowed to have animal blood, let alone human blood. But Jews were murdered, and all the Jews of England were expelled from England because people believed the blood libel. Lies are very, very dangerous. I do, a, I do a podcast called The Fireside Chat. If you don't know of it, I think you will enjoy it very much. It's every week for a half hour from my home, and my dog is next to me most of the time. And I get questions from young people around the world and I got a question a few months ago. Dennis, how do I know who's telling the truth, left or right? It's a very good question. It's a very, very important question to answer. And I gave him the following answer. You know who's lying by who suppresses speech, by who suppresses dissent by who stops arguments. That's how you know who the liar is. People who love truth allow people to differ with them. People who lie do not allow people to differ with them. And that is why I have said all of my life, truth is not a left-wing value. It is a liberal value. It is a conservative value. It is not a left-wing value. There is no example in the last 100 years of the left assuming power and allowing dissent. If you don't know what dissent is, because English is not your language, it means a different opinion. There is no example of the left gaining power, whether it is over a country like Lenin over Russia, or whether it is a university like Columbia University, which I attended, which was just named the least free speech university in America. That means they lie. We, uh, we that means we conservatives, we welcome people who differ. I have invited people who don't agree with me onto my radio show for tens of years, but they almost never come on. If there is any major leftist who wants me on his or her show, I run to be on their show. But they don't invite me. We invite them. They decline and they don't invite us. That is the quick answer to how do I know who's telling the truth, left or right. Just find out who allows difference and who does not? That is how you know. Which brings me to number two of the definition of a conservative. We cherish freedom, liberty. Liberty is a conservative value. It was once a liberal value. It was never a leftist value, never. There was no example 
of, be, of the left being in charge of a country or a university or anything else and people being free. I learned something about freedom. But really, I learned it from the Bible, my favorite book. And I also learned it just from life. Human nature does not desire to be free. Human nature desires to be taken care of. People prefer to be taken care of more than they prefer to be free. And why do I say the Bible? Those of you who know the story of the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews leaving Egypt, as soon as they left Egypt after hundreds of years of horrible slavery, what did they complain? You must read it. It's amazing. We want to go back to Egypt. The food was better. Imagine that. You rather be a slave with better food than a free person with less terrific food? Yeah, that's right. That is why the left wins elections, because they promise people things for free. We'll take care of you. You give me your liberty, we'll give you benefits. That is why the left wins elections all over the world. People don't give a, a damn about being free nearly as much. There are exceptions, obviously. But generally speaking, people do not yearn to be free. Ronald Reagan, the great American president, said, we, are, we Americans are always one generation away from losing our freedom. He was right. It just takes one generation to give up your freedom. And by the way, I, I know not all of you will agree, and I, I accept that, and that's why we have a question and answer period. But in case you didn't believe this to be true, 2020 and 2021 and 2022 proved my point. People gave up all freedom in the name of health. You just tell people health and they give up all of their rights. They, you can't go to a restaurant. You can't go to a store. You will lose your business. We will keep your children out of school. And most people in the, in the world said, okay, okay. This was very depressing. And by the way, I said this in April 2020, one month after the lockdowns. You can look it up on the internet. I tweeted and I wrote a column and I did a broadcast that the lockdowns were the greatest worldwide mistake in history. And I was right. All they did was damage. They were of no benefit whatsoever in terms of health, and they were catastrophic in terms of life and the economies of the Western world. People will give up freedom in the name of better food. They will give up freedom in the name of better health. They will give up freedom if the government says, this is what you must do. The Prime Minister of New Zealand, I play this on my radio show in America regularly. The Prime Minister of New Zealand said, I assume it was in 2021, she said, if you do not hear it from the government, it is not true. You know who said that? Ceausescu and Brezhnev and Stalin and Hitler. If you do not hear it from the government, it is not true. And do you know what? Most people in New Zealand believed her. New Zealand, not Nazi Germany, not Stalin's Russia. New Zealand, they believed her. If it isn't said by the government, it isn't true. Most people in America believe that too. America, the land of the free. Our national anthem has the words, the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's not true any longer. About half of America doesn't care about being free or brave. 
But a half of America does, by the way. The battle is not over. It's a very, very, very powerful conservative movement in the United States of America, thank God. But what was proven to me was how fragile freedom is. People do not yearn to be free. They yearn to be taken care of. They will even keep their children out of school. They will even prevent their children from seeing a face. They will even say okay to airlines that force two-year-olds to wear masks. But children were not dying of COVID. Old people were dying of COVID, not young people. Why were two-year-olds masked? There is no reason other than the desire to exercise control over as much of the population as possible. This was a terrible period in world history, what we just saw with the lockdowns and the closed businesses and the closed schools. But it proved to those who love to control people, we can do it. I wrote a column at the time, it was called Dress Rehearsal for a Police State. Dress rehearsal, for those of you who don't know the term, is when you are getting ready to do, let's say, a Broadway show. And the last rehearsal, everybody wears the costumes and it's the final rehearsal. It's a dress rehearsal, they call it. We just had dress rehearsals for tyrannies. That's what we had. The World Health Organization has just announced that it, it, it would like to see world health passports. Health passports. All humans will have a health passport. Did you see what happened in Canada when the truckers said we will not be forced to take, a, uh, to take the vaccine? And Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, said then you will not have access to your bank accounts. Was there a revolution in Canada? No, not at all. Canadians were perfectly okay with the, the men who drove trucks not having access to their own money. This is your future, my friends. I promise you this. This is what the World Economic Forum wants. This is what the World Health Organization wants. This is what most Western prime ministers and presidents want. This is your future. But I don't know how many people it bothers. I really don't. It bothers the people who invited me. That's why they invited me. By the way, let me say to, the, to you folks who invited me, I want to say something to you. That comes from my heart to, the, to these young men and women of a dictum day, all good that has ever been done has been done by outliers. Outliers means exceptions. The, the people at the far end of the bell curve. The masses have never done good. Always the individuals who stick out and are often hated just want you to know that, and that's how one of the ways I know how good you are. Liberty is a conservative value, and that is why America became the freest country in world history, why the French gave America the Statue of Liberty. And do you know why? Because America was founded on the following belief. You can only have a free society if you have a small government. Communism is the opposite of small government. Socialism is the opposite of small government. Left wing is the opposite of small government. You cannot have free society and big government. But people love big government because it takes care of them, or so they believe, until they need to get into the hospital and they have to wait two months. That is the great lesson of the American founding. Small government means big freedom. 
but people don't want small government. They want to be taken care of, as I have now said about five times in this talk. Small government is the only way to have freedom. I like to remind young people in America that it was big government that was the creator of all the genocides of the 20th century. Do you know 100 million people were murdered? Not soldiers, not combatants. 100 million people, almost all by communism, some by Nazism. But everyone by big government. Everyone. Yeah? So the next time you hear about how great government is, ask them, who killed the most people in history? And you know what they'll say? Religion. That's what you learn in, in school. Religion has killed more people than anything else. Oh, really? Well, how about this, young man, young woman? Maybe secular governments killed more people than religion. We were talking at lunch today, and uh, they mentioned the Spanish Inquisition. Ask a typical Harvard student, how many people do you think were killed in the Spanish Inquisition? I'll bet you they say a million or more. It was about 4,000 over the course of 100 years. It was disgusting and evil, but we need perspective. Big government is a curse. Government has to do something. I'm not an anarchist, but I don't want big government. Not if I want liberty. Number three, what is a conservative? A conservative conserves. <laughs> That's what a conservative does. It's my job to give to my children the best of the past, the best art, the best ideas, the best music, the best religion, the best philosophy, the best wisdom, to give them the, the things that are most beautiful. I need to give them the greatest everything. That is my job, to conserve the best. It's a good job. But that's not what the left believes. They believe in change and innovation. There is no best from the past. The lead music critic of the New York Times a few years ago, Anthony Tomasini, he wrote, this is nonsense that Beethoven's third is the, great, is, is the greatest symphony or even a great symphony, or it might be, but he said, it's not any better than Indonesian gamelan music. Now, most of you do not know Indonesian gamelan music. I have played it on my radio show many times, and many of you who listen can hear the bells in your ear right now. I am not knocking Indonesian gamelan music. But you know what? I, I assert that Beethoven's Third Symphony is greater music. I'm a Jew. I love Jewish music. And allow me to assert, Beethoven's Third is better than Adon Olam. And my cantor is present here from America, and he would agree. And we both love Adon Olam, the final beautiful, fun prayer uh, of, the, uh, of the Jewish service. Of course, it's the greatest music, and I have proof. You know where Beethoven and Bach are heard and played the most in the world today? Japan. In Japan, they don't buy the idea that Beethoven was white European, therefore he wasn't great. They don't measure it by the color of the composer. They measure it by the greatness of the music. How many kids are given Beethoven's third anymore? I wonder what percentage of students at Princeton University can spell Beethoven let alone identify Beethoven's Third Symphony. I wear the badge conservative with honor. Yes, 
I want to give my children and grandchildren the best that humanity has ever produced. That's my job as their father, to give them the best that people have done. That's what a conservative does. A conservative conserves. I looked on Google, you'll love this. I looked up on Google, I just typed in, you, you should do this, what is conservatism? And they say, keeping up tradition, and this is part of the definition on Google, opposition to change or innovation. There you go. I would add, yes, opposition to change for the sake of change. If the change is better, I love change. But if the change is not better, I don't love change. They love change for the sake of change. There was a big, big exhibit at a Dutch museum a few years ago, covered at length in the New York Times arts section. It was a massive exhibit of sculptures. And do you know what the sculptures were? In English, turds. Most of you who are not English speakers don't know what a turd is. Perhaps you know what a poop is. It is what the human being excretes into the toilet bowl. That is what the exhibit was. Sculpted poop. The New York Times covered it as if it was magnificent art. And the museum in, in Holland presented it as if it was magnificent art. That, my friends, is change and innovation. No question. Michelangelo never sculpted a poop. That is true. People with no talent hate the talented. That's part of the, the reason for modern art and modern music. Given the fact that we preserve, we conserve the best of the past, the thing that we most want to conserve is wisdom, which is number four. Conservatives believe in wisdom. So let me tell you a little about wisdom. Wisdom is more important than anything else except truth but you can't have wisdom without truth, so it doesn't matter. Wisdom is more important than good intentions. If you mean well, but don't have wisdom, you will do evil. The number of people who meant well and supported communism is in the tens of millions. The people who gave Stalin the secrets to the atom bomb, meant well. People who supported Stalin and his gulags often meant well. Even many Nazis meant well. Good intentions are worthless. I mean this literally. They are worthless. But we live in the age of intentions matter, not behavior. Because we live in the age of no wisdom. Wisdom is everything. Intentions are nothing. Almost no one wakes up and says, today is my chance to do evil. People don't intend to do evil even when they do evil. You need wisdom to do good, not good intentions. And that's what a conservative knows, and that is why we want to preserve Religion, which I'll get to next. Conservatives conserve wisdom and the pursuit of wisdom. When I was at Columbia University, where I did my graduate work, where I studied Russian uh, and Arabic, I, I was taught nonsense by many of my professors. 
and I was going crazy. Why are such intelligent people teaching me nonsense? This is the 1970s, and I was taught men and women are basically the same. This is not new. Men give birth is new. Men and women are the same is not new. So, believe it or not, I had something come into my brain we call an epiphany. All of a sudden, a Hebrew phrase that I had last said in second grade in Jewish school came to my brain. It is from the Bible, and it is, wisdom begins with the fear of God or the Lord. And that opened my mind to everything. I realized something. There's no wisdom at Columbia University because there's no God at Columbia University. This is extraordinarily important and brings me to number five about religious or Judeo-Christian values. This, if you only remember one point of my talk, and I hope you remember many, this is the one. Secular institutions have no wisdom. I know of no secular institution in America that produces wisdom. They all produce nonsense. There is no wisdom in the secular world. There are secular individuals who may have wisdom because they got, they got wisdom from their parents, they got wisdom because they were raised religious or whatever. But they didn't get it from a secular institution. I could prove it to you. The most foolish institutions in the United States are the most secular institutions in the United States, universities. That's pretty, pretty something. I wrote a column about a year ago. I had more wisdom, and so did all of my classmates, when we were 12 than the Harvard faculty has today because I was at a religious school. And I mean that literally. I believe that I was wiser at 12, and so are my classmates, so this is not about me, than the Harvard faculty or Yale faculty or Berkeley faculty is today. There is no wisdom at our universities. They are the places that come up with men give birth. They are the places that come up with America is systemically racist. They are the places where they come up with defund the police. If we don't give police money, we'll have less crime. They actually say that. Fewer police means less crime. That's stupid. Only secular people say men give birth. Only secular people say men can compete with women in women's sports. You know about that? Do you know about that here in Romania? How often that is happening in, 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 as a controversy in the Western world? A man says he's a woman and he's allowed to run against, even lift weights against women in women's sports. And if you say no, you are a hater and a bigot. Again, only secular people say men can compete against women in women's sports. Only secular people say children who say that they are the other sex should be given drugs to suppress their hormones. Only secular people say girls' breasts should be cut off if they say they're boys. Only secular people say men wearing women's clothing should perform for five-year-olds and six-year-olds. Only secular people Stop saying ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls. That's pretty, that's pretty a strong indictment. If I'm right, don't be secular because you'll get stupid. If I'm wrong, I should shut up and retire. This is a very big claim that only secular people say these things. Either what I said is true or not true. If it's not true, I am a liar. If it is true, don't be secular, because you won't have wisdom. That's a big challenge. We both can't be right. 
Now, not all secular people say this. There are secular people who don't say men give birth. But the only people who do say it are secular. Religious people don't say it. There is a famous quote attributed to G.K. Chesterton, but he probably didn't say it. But it's not my quote. I wish it were. When people stop believing in God, they do not believe in nothing. They believe in anything. That's the world in which we live now. They believe in anything. I believe in God and I believe in the Bible because I see what happens when God and the Bible die. That's the reason. God never appeared to me, not once. It is, it is the secular world that keeps me religious. If the secular world produced wisdom and goodness, my religiosity would be challenged. I admit it. But the utter and total failure of the secular world like the university proves to me there is no wisdom or goodness outside of a Bible-based world. And I don't care if it's, you do it as a Christian, as a Protestant, as, as, as Orthodox, as Catholic, as Mormon, as Jew, as just Bible-based, like many of the founders of America, they were just Bible-based. That is, that is your business. My business is to advocate God and the Bible. I don't see any, any alternative. We speak about Judeo-Christian values, and with this I will end and take your questions. I wrote an essay recently on what are Judeo-Christian values, and I'm a big believer in them. There are Jews who are annoyed with me, and there are Christians who are annoyed with me for using the term. There are Christians who say it's just Christian values. There are Jews who say it's just Jewish values. Judeo-Christian is an appropriate term. I'll give you one good reason. Judaism and Christianity are the only two religions in the world that share a Bible. There is no other example on earth. They both share the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible as their Bible. That's incredible. How could you not speak of Judeo-Christian values when two religions share a Bible. They don't share the entire one, because Jews don't share the New Testament, that's true, but they do share the Old Testament. Islam and Judaism do not share the Old Testament. Islam and Christianity do not share the Old or the New Testament. There is no other example in the world. That's big. What are these values? Well, that the, number one, the Bible is the single greatest and most important source of wisdom. And that we are, uh, we can't live without God as the source of morality. If God did not say do not murder, murder is not wrong. I know this sounds crazy to people in, who, went to, who went to college. If God doesn't say murder is wrong, how do you know murder is wrong? The answer is you don't. You feel murder is wrong. You think murder is wrong. But how do you know murder is wrong? If you answer, well, I would not like to be murdered, it shows that you went to college because you were taught not to think clearly. The fact that you don't want to be murdered doesn't make murder wrong. No murderer wants to be murdered, and they all murder. It's, 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 it's a nonsense answer. The fact that you don't want to be murdered does not make murder wrong. It only means you don't want to be murdered. How do you know it is wrong? You don't. Only if there is something higher than human beings that says, this is right, this is wrong, is this right, and this wrong. That's logic not faith. You can be an atheist and acknowledge what I just said. That's big. That is big. 
in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, it says that all our rights come from the Creator. That is the source of our rights. That's correct. Otherwise, who's the source of your rights? The government? Well, if the government is the source of your rights, the government could take your rights away. It's as simple as that. And that's exactly what has happened in the 20th century and what happened the last four years. We don't want you to have the right to do X, Y, Z, and so you don't have it. By the way, most churches failed too. Most churches were like sheep and they listened to secular, irrational authority. But among those who didn't listen, it was mostly religious groups. They, start, they decided to keep their church or synagogue open. So, there's one more thing that Judeo-Christian values and wisdom have that are not in the secular world. We know that man is not basically good. You cannot have wisdom if you think people are basically good. You're a sweet, nice, kind fool if you believe people are basically good. How anybody who lived in a country that was governed by communism could believe people are basically good shows you how little people learned from the past. How many Romanians had to be tortured by the communist government for you to wonder if people are basically good? How many Ukrainians had to be starved to death by Stalin? How many Jews had to be gassed by Hitler? To live after the 20th century and believe people are basically good? It's mind-blowing. By the way, I don't believe people are basically evil. I just don't believe we're basically good. I believe that making good people is the single most important question any society can ask. And there were no secular answers to making good people. I have often said the biggest difference between my religious education and a secular education, and it's true for a Christian education or a Jewish education. If you are in a real Christian or a real Jewish school, you learn that the greatest problem in your life is you. If you go to a secular school, certainly in America, you learn that the biggest problem in your life is something outside of you. Not you, you're wonderful. Your parents are your biggest problem. America is your biggest problem. Racism is your biggest problem. Poverty is your biggest problem. Not you, you're terrific. That's just not true. I'm not terrific. I got to battle me every single day of my life. How many secular people say they have to battle themselves? The 12-step program, that magnificent program that helps people who are addicted to alcohol or drugs or something else is rooted in the Bible. And the, the key to sobriety, the key to stopping being addicted is to stop blaming others and blame yourself. You cannot become sober if you do not start blaming yourself. That's, that's, that's wisdom. You won't hear that at Columbia. So those are six working definitions of what it takes to be a conservative. It is a term that I hope you would embrace and fight for because there is no guarantee that the evils that this country saw a half century ago won't be repeated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. All right.
I hope my English was clear, I, uh, and I appreciate every Romanian who came tonight. And how are we going to work the Q&A? Yes, Lido. I'm sorry? I'll take over. You will? Okay, terrific. Okay. Oh, so I'm in a seat here? Okay, very good. Okay. Thank you, Dennis, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, for everyone, um, the, the Q&A session will be based on the questions that you sent on, on the Slido link. You can enter on Slido, hashtag Dennis Prager, and submit your questions for the Q&A session that's about to begin. Uh, so the first, I'm here, my name is Daniel. I'm here because uh, Dennis Prager is too big to be, uh, to be hosted by just one host. So we decided that me and Paul would, uh, would carry the night together. Uh, all right, so the, the, I think the, the follow-up question would be, how would you define leftism? If we talked this, uh, this evening about conservatism, how would you define leftism? What is leftism? That is an, it's, it's actually a much tougher question than what is conservatism. For one thing, leftism is, is the hatred of conservatism. That, that's, the, that's one working definition. Those who hate everything we stand for. In America, if you say that everybody should get, ideally everyone should get married, and if possible, make a family, have children, the left hates you. I mean, isn't that amazing? For something so basic as, you know, it would be a good thing for you to get married, and it would be a good thing for you to try to have children. If you say that, you are hated by the left. There is a term they actually use for it, heteronormativity. I, I have mastered English, Russian, Hebrew, French, and leftism. Leftism is its own vocabulary. Uh, it is, uh, <laughs> did you ever hear, I'm curious, heteronormativity? You did? Yeah, I, I salute you. That is impressive that you would know that and not being English speaking. Anyway, number one, it is, it is the hatred of all of what I described as conservative today. That, that would be one element. But what animates them? This is, the, this is the question that I have wrestled with all of my life. And I have a few answers, so I'll try to be brief because it's a, it's a big question, but it, so it takes a big answer. So I have a religious answer to the question. What did God do after creating the world? What did he do for six days? And I, I don't take day literally, and if you do take day literally, I have no problem with you, but I, I, I'm perfectly okay with it being millions or billions of years, but it's six days. What did God do the other six days? Most of the time, God made order out of chaos. The left wants to make chaos out of order. Men give birth is chaos. Atonal music is chaos. Sculpted poop is chaos. There is this deep yearning to destroy all that has been made in the world of Judeo-Christian order. That is a big factor. Number three, they want power. The world is divided between two types of people. Those who do want to control other people and those who don't want to control other people. Conservatives are generally in the second category, but every leftist is in the first category. They have a desire to control you, whether you use a car or not, how much you drive, how, how you teach your children. Uh, it, there is no end, whether you go to work, how you will get health care, they desire to control. And that, those are the animating impulses of leftism, beginning with a hatred of what is beautiful and good. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. 
um, a very voted question would be here. What can be done here in Romania to prevent the leftist ideology that has spread everywhere in the US? Listen, I don't know the answer for the United States, so I'm not, certainly not going to give the answer for Romania. Uh, my answer to Americans who ask me the question is you have to fight. You have one life to live, and do you want to let the bad guys win, or do you want to fight for what is good? I, you know, there is the... The, the, the terrible story of the famous Romanian, I think I'm almost certain he was the Romanian tortured terribly by the communists. I had many. But yeah. You had many. Okay, fine. So nobody, nobody is asking you to get tortured, right? If you fight here or I fight in America, what is the worst that happens? Facebook shuts me down or, or you know, friend, some long old time friends stop talking to me, but I'm not gonna to be tortured. I'm not gonna be arrested by the KGB or by, by, the, by the Gestapo. So th there's, there's no excuse not to fight. It, it, and, and if you don't fight, you make the death of those who did fight pointless. They died for no good reason. So when I went to Normandy Beach, the D-Day invasion of Nazi Europe by, by uh, mostly Americans, but also Canadians and others, and I, I visited there and I saw all these crosses, thousands of crosses, graves of 20-year-olds of who died fighting the Nazis. And I made a vow and I said, if you died to, for freedom, and, and for our values and for my country, then at least I could live for freedom and my country. Otherwise, they died in vain. If you don't fight, the people who did fight fought for no good reason. Thank you for, for the censor. Um, there is a comment here, uh, also voted. I, I don't see it much as a question, but I'll, I'll read it anyway. Regarding your COVID comment, the government lost a lot too by closing our schools and companies. Um, the person writing here says that uh, he or she disagrees with the sole argument that you provided, that they did this only to control us. It must be something else? Yes, there, there is something else. You're entirely right. Part of it is control. It is not the only reason. They learned that they can control us. That's very scary. But there are other reasons. Another reason is that they worship experts. For secular people, when they hear the words experts say, it is like when religious people hear, thus speaks the Lord. It is a secular equivalent for God speaking in the Bible. Experts say. I have no interest in what experts recommend. I only want to know what experts know. I know that, that uh, a biologist knows more about biology than I do, but why would I assume that he would have a wise suggestion about what to do about COVID? That's wisdom, that's not biology. The experts turned out to be overwhelmingly wrong about masks, about lockdowns, about keeping children out of school, about the harm it would do to people. The, uh, we, we now have uh, an excess death rate that uh, is quite scary in some countries uh, as a result of all of that happens. In the United States, a after the lockdowns, the suicide rate among young Americans is the highest that it has ever been in American history. Why did we lock young people down when it was an old people's disease? Sweden didn't. Sweden kept every single school open. No kids died, no teachers died. Until the age of 16, you, were, you went to school the entire COVID in Sweden. So were their experts 
worse experts? No, their experts drew their conclusions based on their wisdom. They, they, they came to their conclusions. Their conclusions made more sense to me. When you are educated in the West, you are taught that you cannot think for yourself. Just ask what experts say and you will know what to think. That is what is taught at, at, at colleges, universities, and even high schools. You have no right to think for yourself. You are to just listen to what experts say. Well, the experts were wrong. And the damage they did to young people is unforgivable. I would follow up on that uh, and, and, and ask you, wouldn't be there also uh, a financial incentive? The inflation, the printing of money, some people did profit and made some enormous profits. Right, but this they, time. yeah, the, the, there was no question about that. Uh, but they, the person who asked it said about the governments, the, uh, at least in, in my country, they didn't care about the inflationary effect of printing more money. The left never cares about that. So it, it, it's, it, it's it, it, it is in part a, it is in part about control, and it is also the the worship of health. If doctors say health. But which doctor do you listen to? I had a doctor on my radio show from the beginning of COVID, a doctor in Brooklyn, New York. May he rest in peace. He died of cancer. He didn't die of COVID. Dr. Vladimir Zelenko. I had him on my radio show a few times. He told me he saved patients' lives who had COVID, old people, by giving them uh, hydroxychloroquine with zinc and later ivermectin. The New York Times and all of the medical authorities laughed, not only laughed, if you were a doctor who said, my patient who has early COVID should take hydroxychloroquine with zinc, you could lose your medical license in America. I took hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and ivermectin for about a year. I, I am not young. I got COVID twice and I was fine. I am not proof, I'm just one individual, I fully acknowledge it, but the idea that hydroxychloroquine is dangerous, it's one of the safest drugs in the world according to WHO and so is ivermectin. And do you know what? In Nigeria and other places in Africa where they take hydroxychloroquine because of malaria, there was far less incident of COVID death. Did you know that? Bet you you didn't. Where were you gonna read it? On, on Facebook? Well, thank you on, the, on that. Um, very good question. Let's move uh, aside and leave aside the, the, the pandemic. Uh, why is socialism, why is leftism so appealing to young people in the US and perhaps around the world? Because it, it appeals to good intentions. Look, we'll take care of you. End of issue. It sounds beautiful. That's why I made such a big deal about good intentions don't mean anything. Wisdom is everything. Do you know my belief is that there is something harder than heroin to stop being addicted to, and that is free things from the government. It is easier to stop taking heroin, I believe this literally, than it is to stop taking things for free. Oh, um, yeah, another very interesting question here. Uh, why do you think the majority of conservatives all over the world are Christian? What would you consider to be the link? Or is there a link between Christianity and conservatism? Well, I, there is a link, but I wish there were a, a stronger link. <laughs> uh, it's not, as I said, most of the, the vast majority of churches in America were uh, sheep just like secular institutions were sheep. And, and that was very, very depressing to me. But of those who are fighting, Christians are a, are a, a larger proportion. 
that that is correct. And I and I and I said why? Because all the only people who say men give birth are secular. So religious people who take their religion seriously will will not uh, say things that are not true like that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, why do you as a conservative want to conserve, this is an, an interesting question, why do you as a conservative want to conserve a corrupt society where oligarchs and big companies control wealth? Shouldn't wealth be redistributed fairly? I, think I don't want the other to, side. just for the record, I don't want to conserve corruption. Just <laughs> let me say that for the record. <laughs> I don't want to conserve rape. I don't want to conserve murder. I don't want to conserve bank robbery. <laughs> I don't want to conserve child abuse. And I don't want to conserve corruption. Uh, the answer to uh, uh, getting rid of corruption is not redistributing money in the society. That, that's the problem. What is the answer? It's a very, it's very complex. One answer is a press that, that is free to report the corruption in a government. The United States government is probably more corrupt than the Ukrainian government at this time. I can't tell you how sad I am to say this, but I do believe that. And the reason that most Americans do not know this is because the New York Times and CNN do not tell them this. And if you do tell them this, you might be shut down. I'd like you to tell people what it was like advertising my talk on Facebook here in Romania. To tell yeah, people. Yeah, we, we were shadow banned by Facebook. Um, yeah, by a considerable, considerable margin. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, just want you to know true. that. I spoke here five years ago. Yeah. And it didn't happen then. The, the answer to corruption is knowledge. Let people know about the corruption. There's no free press in Russia, and the mainstream press in the United States is very similar to the pro-Putin press in, in, uh, in Russia. And I don't know about your press, if your press is or is not revealing uh, where and who is corrupt, but that's, that's the job. That is one of their jobs. But uh, a conservative does not want to conserve corruption. The left wants to conserve corruption, in the United States at least, because it benefits from it. Yeah, um, where's the question? It was a very good question, but it jumped. Oh yeah. What did Americans did wrong? Um, so that a country founded by Bible-based, or Bible-believing people came out so, so bad nowadays. What went wrong and where? I actually gave the answer very briefly in my talk when I said Americans didn't explain America to their children and Christians didn't explain Christianity to their children. People forgot how to make the case for what they believe in. That's what has happened. It's, there is a certain irony, <laughs> I feel funny saying this, but I do believe this, uh, so either I'm right or I'm wrong, but I do believe that at least in America, there is no Christian who has brought more people to Christianity than I have, and I'm a Jew. <laughs> uh, and the reason is because I know how to explain the need for God and the Bible. And it's, it's, I, I do it solely on the basis of reason. That's why my Bible commentary is called the Rational Bible. And uh, people can be persuaded if you just use reason. I never use faith to bring people to faith. I only use reason to bring people to faith. But most religious people use faith to bring people to faith and it's not working. Thank you, Dennis. Um, we were closing 8.30, and uh, I'll, I'll have, I'll read, uh, I think, two more questions. Uh, one is, what is a woman? P.S. Matt Walsh. Yeah. One, one would think that the answer is fairly obvious. There are certain chromosomes, and there, there, the production of eggs 
rather than uh, of sperm. I mean, there are certain basic biological answers that are so obvious. The left says it's pro-science, and yet they say you're a woman if you think you're a woman? Are, are, you, uh, are, are you a white if you're black and think you're white? Are you a black if you're white and think you're black? And, and that isn't even a chromosome issue. That's just skin color. It, it's, this is the proof of how much nonsense the secular world produces. Anyway, I have, a, uh, I have my own little proofs that it doesn't work. I will know that a man became a woman if he can now find things that he could not find when he was a man. Okay, that, 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 he really did become a woman. He's now finding all these things. Or I'll give another one. If he becomes a woman and thinks about sex less than he did when he was a man, he became a woman. If a woman becomes a man, I applaud the 12 of you who applauded. <laughs> if a woman says she is now a man and she thinks of sex as much as men do, well, maybe she really did change. But it, it, it's, it's all nonsense. You cannot become a man if you're a woman. You can feel you did, fine. It's a fr you're, free to, you're free to feel what you want, but you cannot become one. You cannot become another animal, you cannot become another race, you cannot become another sex. Thank you for that. Um, a question and another one. So these are the last two, I promise. Um, we see people like George Soros using billions of dollars to build the world of lies. Why don't we have a group of conservative billionaires to fight the good fight? Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting question. There are some who do. I, I want you to understand PragerU raises tens of millions of dollars a year. There are, there are generous conservatives, and, and we are a living example of that fact. But it doesn't compare to the Soros money or, the, all, the, or all of the big businesses that gave Black Lives Matter hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions. I, 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 don't, I don't know the exact sum. And, but the reason is not because they're leftists, it's because they're cowards. It takes courage to be a businessman and support a conservative cause. It doesn't take any courage to support Black Lives Matter or to support the Democratic Party. Thank you on that. I would also add vision, perhaps, uh, especially for, uh, for Romania, for the businessmen in Romania. Uh, it's difficult to see where the danger is coming from and how uh, impressive and how destructive this danger of leftist ideology is for our country. That's one thing to chew on. Um, now the last question, which would be a follow-up uh, on, on, the, on the previous one, and thank you for this one. How can we support the Dictum Day uh, NGO? You are doing an amazing job, thank you, with conferences and online articles. We are blessed to have this kind of NGO in the public sphere. Thank you for this comment. Uh, thank you for uh, considering supporting a Dictum Day. Uh, well, most of you have uh, received uh, a badge and on, on the back of the badge is a QR code, uh, which will be a link to our website uh, where you can donate and help us uh, organize this kind of, of events. Um, there are people who are willing and who have the vision and who are willing to invest in this kind of events, understanding the dangers of the leftist ideology coming to Romania, but then there are not many. I, I will tell you that there are not many. We, we hope to, be, uh, to, have, uh, to, to have more people uh, in, in this evening tonight with us, uh, but it's, it's not easy. For, to, to make the case for, for the conservative ideology, for what we stand 
but we try. We must fight, as Dennis Prager said, and we thank you for that. By the way, I, I, it's funny because I wanted to say just before you were going to say goodbye that you, you people do need to support your terrific group. So you will enjoy this that I, a point I make in America all the time. There are three types of people. Those who fight, those who help the fighters, and those who do nothing. Most people are in the third group. They do nothing. They're not bad people, they just do nothing. But I want you to know that helping fighters is as good as fighting. Because the fighters cannot fight without supplies. It's true in, in a real war, it's true in a verbal war. So you are fighters. I, I thank God that you, you and your group exist. And people need to, to help the fighters not everybody is meant to be a fighter. It's just as important to give the troops supplies. So I, I really, really hope you will do that for a dictum day. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you everyone for, uh, thank you all. for thank being you. with us this night. It was uh, an you. honor to have you, Dennis, here. An honor to have you, everybody, yeah. here with us tonight. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.